Welcome to Nugget 256 with Steve and Dana Groman, and this will be the creation portion of our comparison between how a creationist and how an evolutionist looks at the Grand Canyon. In Nugget 255, we took a few moments to tell you about the evolutionary theory about how the Grand Canyon was formed. Today, I will be getting some information that was written by the creationist Tom Vail, Michael Ord, Dennis Bacovi, and John Hergen, rather. This is your guide to the Grand Canyon, A Different Perspective. It's part of their True North series, and they have done beautiful books on other national parks. I recommend these books. They're very well done. One of the charts in this book, they talk about the differences between the Grand Canyon from an evolutionary world view or a creationist worldview. One looks at it as a long period of time and one as a supernatural creation. Another shows abundant evidence for slow, gradual process. As far as the worldwide geologic record would show, the evolutionists believe it shows that there is an abundant amount of evidence for slow, gradual process, where creationists views it as showing evidence of a rapid, catastrophic process. The fossil record would, according to evolution, reveal abundant transitional life forms. Creation, lack of transitional life forms. Biological systems would become more complex with time, according to creation be created complex and fully functional initially. Geologic features would be evolution a local nature. In creation, large scale in nature. Intelligence in the animal kingdom would be, according to evolution, learned and according to creation inherited. There is no middle ground. There is no compromise. It's either one or the other. I had mentioned that we had seen fossils when we were rock climbing at Bright Angel Wall in the Grand Canyon on the South Rim. We learned about the climbs. That one was the Wailing Wall. This is the first amphitheater theater encountered when accessing the Bright Angel Walls from the approach trail. The amphitheater is east-facing and offers good morning sun in the fall and spring. Let me jump down. The climbs here are short, mixed sport and traditional. There is decent limestone here with cool fossils and seashells all around. And that was the point that I was getting at. Everyone knows that these fossils are there. It's just not us as creationists saying that they are. They are there. Where we dropped down off the trail to set up our climbing station was this sign. Three thousand thirty million years ago. And this is the trail of time. It's so sad that they have these medallions along the trail and people walk by these and believe it. If you see signs like this, make sure that you understand and you can explain to whoever you're with how this is inaccurate. The following are a couple of examples and explanations of the fossil evidences seen in the canyon. And I thought this was an exceptionally interesting chart in that it talks about that there are sponges in the K-Bab formation, ferns at the Hermit Formation. There are trackways in the Coconino, Hermit, and Supai Formations. Crinoids in the Kebab, Toro Weep, Supai, Redwall, and Bright Angel. And we did see some crinoids while we were climbing there at Bright Angel. And there's Toro Weep, that place that I had mentioned I really want to go to at some point in time. There are brachiopods in the Kebab, the Toro Weep, the Redwall, Temple Butte, the Muav, and Bright Angel. There are nautiloids in Redwall, stromatolites in the Grand Canyon Supergroup, worm burrows at Bright Angel, sea urchin spines at Red Wall, trilobites in the K-Bab, Bright Angel, and Tapetes, horn coral in the K-Bab and Red Wall, and bryozones in the K-Bab, Toro Weep, Red Wall, and Temple Butte. Isn't that amazing? And then they have some different pictures associated with the different fossils and the rock layers, and it all proves a worldwide catastrophic flood at one time. In Bright Angel, where we climbed, there were crinoids, brachiopods, worm burrows, and trilobites. And it's very difficult to take pictures of these, but you can see the one in the photograph. The whole wall was just loaded with them. Not too many decades before John Wesley Powell made his first exploratory trip through the Grand Canyon in 1869, the dominant view in the Christian world of Europe and America was that God created the world in six 24-hour days, about 4,000 BC. According to this view, about 1,500 years later, the earth was judged with a global catastrophic flood during the time of Noah. It was during the 18th century and the time of Darwin and and his ilk, people like Powell were influenced. In 1908, scientists dogmatically believed the canyon was over 70 million years old and the river preceded the rise of the plateaus through which it cut, the Colorado River being antecedent to the plateaus, which originated from John Wesley Powell. Soon, scientists realized that the antecedent river theory had problems and other theories were suggested. However, in the mid 
1900s, scientists realized that the Grand Canyon was much younger, possibly only 5 million years old. This brought rise to several new theories. To this day, scientists are still debating the merits and problems of different theories in an attempt to solve the riddle of the origin of the Grand Canyon. Well, we can solve it, can't we? God's Word told us exactly what happened and when it happened, and we don't have to change anything. And in the previous nugget, I had talked about Hermit's Wrist and how we had gone there. I don't believe that we caught a picture of it. On the stone pillar of the patio is a plaque of Psalm 68.4, donated in the late 1960s by the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary. The sisters also placed plaques at Lookout Studio and Desert View Tower. And here is a picture of me at the Desert View Tower in 2001. Due to inquiries by the ACLU, they were removed in 2003, prompting a firestorm of public protest. The Alliance Defense Fund intervened, providing legal support for the sisters, and the Park Service soon replaced them. I don't know if the one is at Hermit's Rest any longer. There is the Natural View which says it's millions or billions of years old, that there was no global flood, and it is a particle at a time deposition, and that the canyon was cut slowly by a river. The other view, the creationist biblical worldview, there was a worldwide flood with rapid deposition by a flood, and the canyon was cut catastrophically, which makes sense. Long period of time versus a short period of time. The extent of sedimentary rock layers would be small with local origin and distribution, where a creationist viewpoint would show continent-wide distribution, which is what we see. Or, as the creationists would view it, it would reflect rapid rates of deposition and erosion. In our Way Back Wednesday that we posted two days ago, we went back and reposted Nugget 25 when we talked about the squirrels that cannot mate. So I want to encourage you to go back and watch that. There are two different tassel-eared squirrels found in the Grand Canyon. An interesting discussion has ensued regarding these furry little critters. The isolated North Rim squirrels, called KBAB squirrels, have distinct color differences from the South Rim population called the Abert squirrels. KBAB squirrels have a dark body with an all-white tail, while the Abert squirrels have a white chest and belly with a gray and white tail. They were formerly considered a separate species, but since it has been determined that there is no significant difference other than the color, now the KBAB squirrel is classified as a variety or subspecies of the Abert squirrel. The color difference in the two populations has been called a textbook case of evolution and how species originate. Is it evolution or just variation with in a kind. If it were evolution caused by the isolation and vastness of the canyon, why are KBAB squirrels also found in Mexico? So what's the bottom line? What is the bedrock message of the Grand Canyon? It is either a monument to time or a monument to the flood. I want to make this point and they make the point in this book and I'm just going to read what they say. And if it is a monument to the flood, then remember that it is the result not of God's initial creation, but of his judgment of a world marred by sin. The canyon stands before for us today as evidence of the time when the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. Genesis 6, 5, 13, and 17. Oftentimes people, they look at something beautiful on this earth and they talk about how it's part of God's creation. Well, it is beautiful and it's part of his creation, but it's actually after the flood. Even in total devastation, what is left is still so beautiful and we are so grateful for places like the Grand Canyon that testify to Noah's flood. In this book, they talk about how to see the Grand Canyon, and we've already discussed that primarily in my Saturday travel and history tip, and I hope that you will go and watch those, and specifically the one when we went on the Wallapai Indian Reservation along Diamond Creek Road to reach the Grand Canyon National Park and the Colorado River. If you appreciate our content, tell others and repost on your social platforms. Thank you.